Well, when last we talked with the frugal repairman, uh, it sort of came to a, well, an unfortunate end when uh, we discovered that there were several things wrong with that radio that we were using as a model, and it really wasn't worth the uh, time and materials to uh, try to fix it up. So we're beginning this uh, sort of new frugal repairman, if you want to call it that, with uh, a different radio. It's essentially the same circuit. It's an RCA Victor, and I'll show you more details in a in a minute, but it's basically the same five tube uh, All-American 5 that uh, the other one had. It does have a better appearing speaker. The uh, cabinet is in a lot better condition. I went to get the, the cabinet to show you. It's got a lot of paint spots on it, but the uh, this radio actually reminds me of a radio that my parents owned uh, back in the 1940s, late 40s, early 50s. The one they had was actually an AM-FM. This is sort of the AM-only version of the same radio. Uh, well, no, it's not the same. It's It looks on the outside the, about the same, except instead of having an AM dial and an FM dial, it just has the AM dial. But the, so this radio has some nostalgic value to me, and the, uh, the radio itself was made by RCA, I think starting in 45 or 46, but it appears in the 1948 or 49 literature, and I'll show you that in a second. So, before we jump back in with uh, some things, let me show you a few things about this radio to, uh, to kind of get you started, to sort of bring you up to speed. The particular model we're talking about here is a model 8X53. The chassis uh, number is RC, uh, well, let me look at the back here. RC 1064. So, this is the actual RCA Victor service data. In other words, it's the factory, factory data from RCA. Let me lay this back down so it won't fall. And here is the the radio, let me turn it this way so that we can see a little bit. Here are the five tubes. The 50L6 is the output tube, the audio output tube that drives the speaker. Speaker is here. The detector and first audio amplifier is the 12SQ7. The SK7 is the IF amplifier, and notice there are two transformers. This is the second IF, first IF. Uh, now, these are first IF transformers. Don't confuse, all IF uh, receivers have two transformers and one tube. If you have a second IF tube, then you would have another IF transformer. So it would be a first, a second, and a third IF transformer, and two IF tubes, a first IF tube and a second IF tube. I only tell you that because if you get a more complicated radio, don't get confused. These just, the numbers on these are just the order they appear in the schematic. So the one closest to the antenna is called the first IF transformer. And the next one is called the second. And then if there is more than one uh, after that, that, that one is called third and so on. T3 is the output transformer. And the uh, first detector is really, it should be called the converter because it's the tube that converts the RF that is the signal you're listening to, to the IF, that is the signal that you amplify in the radio. 
Then there's a 35Z5 rectifier. Over here is the tuning capacitor C3 for the oscillator and uh, C4 for the or C1 for the antenna, and then C2 and C4 are the trimmer capacitors for those two sections. So let's see where that is in the radio itself. Here's the 50L6 12SQ7 detector, 12SK7 IF amplifier first and second IF transformers, output transformer, speaker, 12SA7 converter or first detector, 35Z5 rectifier, and then here oscillator and antenna uh, tuning. Now, the reason that there are fewer plates on this one than there are on this one is because the oscillator in a superheterodyne normally operates above the incoming frequency. So, this is tuned to the radio station. Let's suppose you're listening to uh, a 970. So, this is tuned to 970. But the oscillator has to operate 455 kilohertz or whatever the IF is above 970. So this frequency is much higher. And of course, for higher frequency, that means smaller capacitor. Okay, that's a kind of general overview. Now I'd like to show you the method I plan to use. Here is the method that I use. I certainly don't say it's the only way. I'm not even claiming it's necessarily the best way. It's just a way that I have uh, come to over the years, and it represents my view of working on these old radios in the present day. This is quite different from the way they were worked on back in the 50s, for example. I used to turn out uh, five or six of these radios in an evening uh, back in the late 50s and early 60s, working when I was in uh, high school, working part-time at a radio and TV shop. But quite different method back then. It was really, you know, find the thing, fix it, set it aside, and get on to the next one. This is a much more leisurely method. First, I always remove the line cord. You've seen there's been some debate on this. Some people think that, oh, that's, that's uh, overkill or clickbait or whatever. I do that because I don't want to accidentally plug the, the radio in while I'm working on it. I want to get all the way down here to this next to last step that you'll see in a minute before I ever power the, the radio up. And since I know I'm going to replace the line cord anyway, I always remove it. Now, nine times out of ten, it's already pretty bad, frazzled, etc. But even if it's not, I remove it. Then I do a visual inspection. Then I measure the resistances. Now, this is where we ended the first part of the frugal repairman. My next step would be to replace the paper caps. But one of the things that you'll discover about replacing the paper caps is that it is a good idea to test the new caps. Now, I generally use these film capacitors that are available today. They have a, a 630 volt, well, for some reason, yeah, there it is, 600, let me try to get it to focus, there we are, 630 volt reading, and they're perfectly adequate for these radios. Now, an audiophile would snicker at those capacitors because uh, there is a, uh, well, depends on your point of view. <laughs> but uh, let's just say that some audiophiles think that if you haven't spent at least 30 or $40 on every capacitor, you just don't have anything worth listening to. Let's not get into all of that. But I generally replace the paper caps, but when I uh, replace them, I make sure that the new cap is reasonably close in value and does not leak. And I point this out because I have found an occasional capacitor, even though it's brand new and not new old stock, brand new film capacitor like this, that 
uh, would either not withstand the voltage or would leak. And so I always test the capacitors as I replace them. There's a second thing that I suggest you do in this step, which is also check the outside foil. And we'll do that in the next video. But for right now, we're just talking about the method. So we'll replace the paper caps. Then what I do is check the filter caps for shorts. Uh, you can do that with a resistance reading, just a, a simple multimeter in the ohms position. I also check the tube filaments. You may have noticed that uh, actually the way I measured the resistance in that first radio effectively checked the tube filaments as well. In other words, checking them for continuity. I also check the pilot lights to make sure that they are uh, have continuity. Then I connect a new line cord, either a three wire with a ground or a polarized two prong cord. I also connect a new fuse, a, a proper fuse in, and when we get there I'll show you. I use a fuse socket and I usually find a place on the underside of the chassis where I can uh, hook that fuse socket. Then I slowly power the unit up with isolation. What I mean by that is an isolation transformer and I usually use a variac. You could do this with an isolation transformer and a uh, dim bulb tester, which we'll talk about when we get there. Then once I have it powered up, I check the V-plus voltage as it is powering up to see that it does, uh, it does power up. Obviously, if the V-plus voltage is low, then I may have to go back and check the uh, filter capacitors again to see if any of those are leaky and that's the cause or if there's some other reason why there's low voltage. But then once I've checked the B-plus voltage, then I begin looking to see what might be wrong with the radio. At that point, most radios will start working, but some won't, in which case you might have some additional steps that we will talk about perhaps at some point in the future. But usually if you follow this method, by this time, if the B-plus comes up, usually your radio will work if you followed these steps. Furthermore, it'll be a lot safer than it was because you now have a, a polarized or three-wire polarized cord, so the chassis is no longer a danger. Even though you put the chassis in, a, uh, in an insulated uh, case, which, by the way, was a requirement that they began to impose right after World War II. But even if you do that, if somebody pulls a knob off the the control, like this one, is you notice is connected right to the chassis. So if the chassis is hot and somebody pulls the knob off and touches this, and believe me, three-year-olds can do that. Actually two-year-olds can do that. Uh, and, and if the plug is put in wrong and you haven't replaced it with a polarized plug, the, uh, this can have 110 volts on it. So I suggest you do all of these steps. Obviously, if you know more about what you're doing or perhaps you have a mentor who has a different method, nothing wrong with that. But this is my method. This is where I'm going to be going with this radio. I'm looking forward to a couple more parts on capacitors. One is how to test paper caps. The second uh, part of that, or, or maybe in the same video, how to find the outer foil. And we'll talk about why we want to do that when we get there. And then, finally, how you can power up the radio so you can begin checking operation. Now, I'm not going to get into things like alignment in this series, partly because alignment requires you to buy equipment like a signal generator. And you can do everything I've talked about here without buying anything other than the multimeter that I've talked about so far, except one thing. You do have to have some way of checking your paper caps but there are many alternatives there, and we'll talk about that in the next video. 
So I hope this has been helpful, useful. I'm looking forward to this RCA Victor uh, radio. And in the meantime, have a nice day.